Greetings gaming historians and welcome to Lord of Lore, where we break down the lore and history of our favorite video games and fantasies. And today, we're returning to the world of Dragon's Dogma to discuss a prominent aspect of the game's world, and that is the Beastron. A cat-like race hailing from the deserts of Batal, the Beastron are one of the two playable races in Dragon's Dogma 2. In addition to their unique anatomy and culture, the Beastron also have many mysterious elements that contribute to the world and history of Dragon's Dogma 2, which we will be exploring in today's video. Now fair warning, there are spoilers ahead. Let's discuss! To begin, let's take a look at some of the more prominent elements of the Beastron in Dragon's Dogma 2. As evidenced by both gameplay and dialogue, the Beastron stand out from other races like humans, not only in their anatomy, but also in how they are treated. In the human-controlled regions of Vermund, Beastron often face prejudice from other humans, as can be seen in both their dialogue and the high percentage of Beastron in the slums of Vernworth. This persecution has led many Beastron to leave for the city of Bakpatal, a Beastron-led kingdom ruled by Empress Nadinia and her priestesses. Despite the harsh regions of Batal including deserts, volcanoes, and monster hordes, the citizens of Batal enjoy a fairer culture in which there are few class distinctions and the religious leadership is well loved, as opposed to the disgruntled class system of Vermont. However, the Beastron culture is not without its flaws. While there are a number of humans in the settlement that rarely suffer prejudice, many Beastron look down on the pawns due to their association with the coming of the dragon. While Empress Nadinia has made efforts to maintain peace and even improve acceptance of pawns, the prejudice is still felt clearly in the game, as players and their pawns will always be hounded by guards until they acquire a permit, and even then a gang of Beastron will outright challenge the player to a fight after mocking their pawns. In addition, the nations of Vermont and Batal have been no stranger to war. After natural disasters and resource shortages brought hardship for both kingdoms, they engaged in many battles that left deep tension between their kingdoms even after the war was over. However, according to the game and websites, Empress Nadinia has been working hard to improve the conditions of all within her kingdom. Overall, whereas Vermont is a traditional monarchical society, Beastron culture seems to be more theocratic in its structure as well as more meritocratic in its various organizations. Instead of bloodlines, leaders of organizations like guards and laboratorians seem to advance their position through valor and achievement. Now that we got the basics out of the way, let's dig deeper and try to learn more about the Beastron history. Unfortunately, there is practically no lore on how the Beastron came to be with even one of the loading screens saying that their origin is a mystery. However, we can infer more about their history and relationship with the rest of the kingdoms by drawing connections with various lore. This all starts with the various headless statues found in the game. As players will learn later, these defaced statues are in fact statues of Rothos, an ancient Beastron arisen and the founder of the Kingdom of Vermont. As we have discussed in previous videos, Rothos appeared to be destined to be the world's next Seneschal or the Pathfinder's current equivalent of the title, but the Mad King chose instead to defy the Pathfinder's will and descend from the heavens. There, he built a worldly kingdom that would later grow into Vermund, stretching all across the game map. However, why are his statues defaced and why are Vermund and Batal often at odds? To answer this, we need to look at some of the lore found by exploring the noble quarters of Vernworth. Talking to one of the nobles reveals that whenever a human and a Beastron mate, the child is almost always a Beastron, and this is later reinforced by Wilhelmina's questline. At the conclusion of the quest, Wilhelmina is revealed to be half Beastron, with her human appearance being so rare that the corrupt noble Allard could hardly believe it. Now, let's take this information and look at the architecture that is prominent at Bach Batal and even found in Batal ruins. In these murals, we see a Beastron king and another well-decorated figure that looks similar to Middle Eastern depictions of royal women. This appears to be a human woman, and add that with the fact that she and the Beastron king stand out from the rest of the figures, it would almost imply that the Beastron king, likely Rothos or some descendant, took a human queen as his partner. In all likelihood, their child would have been a Beastron. And this is where my theory on the division of Ramund and Batal comes from. As can be seen in the persecution and defaced statues, many Vermundians fear that the Beastron will outnumber them due to interbreeding. Because Vermund was once a Beastron-led kingdom, it seems likely that sometime in the past, the humans feared the growing Beastron population and expelled them from the north, taking great effort to hide their origins by destroying statues and depicting all their sovereign rulers as human. And based on the many ruins and dialogue of hardship, it seems that the ousted Beastron struggled for a long while until the ancestors of Empress Nadinia brought order and unity to the harsher lands of Vital. 
While the land of Batal still isn't free of trouble, as can be seen by the secret of Dragon Labs and attempted Empress assassination, the people of Batal are still far more loving of their Empress and the priestesses than the Vermundians do their Regent Queen. United by their perseverance and their reverence for the Lambent Flame, the people of Batal carry on through all hardships. Now we get to the other prominent question of the Beastern culture. What is the Lambent Flame? I don't know. Unfortunately, there is practically no lore I could find about the Lambent Flame, whether it was dialogue, notes, or even hints throughout the world. All we know is that it is believed that the Lambent Flame protects Batal from the dragon, and it is tended diligently by the Empress and her priestesses. While the fire does have a bluish glow that resembles powers of the rift, I also didn't notice any change in the unworld world, which is supposed to bring drastic changes on such powers. If I have to make a theory, then I would tie it to Rothos, who not only founded the kingdom that would become Vermund and Batal, but also would have been the earliest known arisen to slay the dragon. Although they may not know who Rothos is, the statues and Bach Batal murals indicate that the Beastrans still trace themselves to a Beastran founder. Because Rothos founded his kingdom by slaying the dragon, and because he also wielded Seneschal-like powers, it is likely that the Lambent Flame is some gift or remnant of Rothos that was left and tended diligently by his descendants. But whether or not the Lambent Flame has any supernatural properties beyond this is still open to speculation. And that about does it for today's video. The Beastrin are a major aspect of Dragon's Dogma 2, but we still know so little about their lore. What do you think? Do you have any theories on where the Beastrin may have come from? What is the Lambent Flame? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and remember to drop a like and subscribe so my channel can grow. Feel free to comment what you would like to see next, new videos regularly. God bless!